Hey everyone, this is Lecture 8 for POS 273 International Relations, an online undergraduate course taught at the University of Maine. And I'm the instructor Rob Glover. Um, so today we're going to look at feminist approaches to international relations. And um, we'll ask a number of questions. Uh, one thing I'll preface uh, this, this lecture with is that there are lots of different ways in which feminist ideas are used in international relations. Um, and so you could have you know, a feminist approach that would result in really different questions and really different answers. It's kind of a loose collection of theoretical insights as opposed to, uh, you know, an overarching theory like realism or liberalism. Um, so we'll ask, what are the basic assumptions of feminist IR theory? And what are the implications of a feminist worldview of international relations? And then as we've been doing, um, we'll look at uh, feminist application uh, to understand the Iraq War, and we'll also talk about the feminist perspective in relation to, to zombie fiction. Uh, so to start off, um, some basic assumptions of feminist IR theory. As I said, it's a broad collection of ideas and uh, insights, uh, much of it coming over from feminist theory, uh, you know, philosophy, sociology, sociolo sociology of gender. Um, but there are some basic assumptions that we carry over into understanding international relations. The first and foremost uh, assumption that you are probably familiar with is the idea of gender as a social construction. So there is a distinction made between biological sex and gender, the latter of which is a set of social norms and expectations associated with one's sex. So. Um, the idea is, is to really push back against the notion that there are certain inherent differences between men and women. Uh, there are in a biological sense, right? Um, but with regard to roles, characteristics, behavior, um, feminist theorists are going to say that a lot of what we attach to gender is um, socialized. It's uh, a product of social interaction and a set of social expectations that societies and communities and the family structure and school and entertainment media culture uh, ingrain in us. There is not necessarily an inherent biological um, necessity to a lot of the behaviors associated with men and women. Um, that has important implications for um, behavior uh, because these gendered assumptions, the expectations that we bring to our lives, can um, create implications for uh, how we behave, right? How we behave, how the, the roles that we play, the things that we're expected to do, and also how we study and analyze our reality, including international relations. And the third and final assumption is that in our narratives of international affairs, as we try to understand what is happening at the international level, very often the experiences of women, which are consequential in every aspect of human life, are not highlighted, not highlighted or they're misrepresented. And so they mis may be misrepresented um, strategically, and we'll talk about that a little bit with uh, the Iraq War, or they could just be misrepresented as a result of ignorance, as a result of not trying to know and understand the reality of women's lives. Um, so a frequent question that feminists uh, will ask in IR, but also in any um, realm of inquiry in which you are applying feminist theory is where are the women, right? What is, what is it exactly that women are doing and how do they understand what they're doing? How do we kind of give women voice in uh, societies and, and um, in inquiry that too often uh, disregards their their voices and disregards their own characterization of their experiences. So those are some basic assumptions. Those are really broad. Um, this is not as specific and it doesn't necessarily give you a clear cut picture of what the world is going to look like. These um, different assumptions can manifest themselves in different ways in international relations, but as a broad family of ideas, this is what we're talking about when we say feminist IR theory. The implications of the feminist worldview are, are pretty interesting. So the first is that um, our knowledge is shaped by these gendered constructions. So gendered construction of knowledge is going to shape what we view as important and relevant in international relations and how we define and map out these areas of importance. 
So for a long time, for instance, international relations was the study of war and peace. It was the study of international security. That was the bread and butter of international relations. And um, for much of human history, the way that this was studied was the actions of men, right? The actions of men on the battlefield, the actions of world leaders who were almost exclusively men, and um, the language and the framework for understanding international security evolved in such a way that it was very masculine, right? It was focused on power and control and weakness and dependence, and it created these dichotomies um, of how we understand the world and how we understand international relations. The second implication is that women and gender generally has been socially constructed to serve certain interests and certain agendas in international relations. So we can think of this in terms of foreign policy decisions that are framed um, to protect vulnerable populations, right? And very often, um, protecting women, protecting children has entered into foreign policy making as a justification for certain violent actions. Um, we'll see that a little bit with the with the explanation of the war in Iraq. Um, you can also think about how uh, the attributes that one is supposed to bring to foreign policy making and international relations break down in pretty black and white terms. Uh, so there is an emphasis put on power and control and dominance and projecting strength. And then the opposite of that is, you know, weakness and, um, uh, you know, more nurturing and caring perspectives, things like empathy. And that's actually viewed as a weakness in international relations. And those are very gendered constructions of certain values and behaviors, right? So they feed over into what we expect from foreign policymakers and who we elevate as very good um, uh, players in international relations. I think the other implication of the feminist worldview is that women have knowledge and perspective and experiences that have been shut out of our study of international relations for too long uh, and that women have to be allowed to define their experiences and make demands in their own terms. Um, so there has been too much talking uh, for women and, and talking on behalf of women uh, in international relations, both our study of it and then the practice of international relations. And that's an important implication of the feminist worldview. So um, one question that will frequently be, be asked in feminist IR theory, and it comes up in the readings that you did for today, is where are the women? Uh, and that relates to that final bullet point, right? Feminist IR theorists argue that women are either absent from discussion of international issues or they're discussed according to overdetermined gender roles. Um, so gender roles that uh, don't actually do justice to the dynamism and the um, diversity of the roles that women play within their societies and within international relations. So if we look throughout history, um, we see uh, examples in which uh, international relations is discussed and women are absent entirely. So you look back to historical accounts of war and it's accounts of great uh, foreign policy leaders who are often men and then what's happening on the battlefield. And for long periods of human history, um, the actual conduct of war, women haven't been involved in a, a military capacity. Therefore, it's not deemed relevant. Whereas, you know, society might be, be uh, held up by women while men are off at war, but that's not discussed. That's not actually, and that doesn't enter into the narrative. Um, so you have settings in which international relations is discussed and women are just not there. They're absent from the discussion. Um, you see them frequently painted as helpless, innocent victims, right? And so uh, extreme campaigns of violence are justified on the need to protect women and mothers and children uh, and they're constructed as these figures that don't have any agency that can't actually defend themselves and need a strong protective masculine figure to step in and protect them or um, women are put into traditional nurturing roles right so here we see um, this call for women to take on a nurturing role because their country needs them that their way of supporting the war effort will not be in a violent capacity, but will be in this way that uh, corresponds to allegedly natural qualities of nurturing and care, right? And that's pretty common. Um, and then lastly, <coughs> I have to talk a little bit about perceptions of powerful women in international relations. Um, so within 
international relations today and even throughout history, there have been women who took on positions of power. And they're often kind of saddled with a set of expectations for how they ought to behave in those settings um, that are very masculine, right? Um, so here you have pictures of uh, Golda Meir, who was the, um, the leader of Israel during the 1970s. You have Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State and then ran for president. You have Margaret Thatcher, <coughs> who um, for nearly a decade, roughly a decade, was the Prime Minister of the UK. And then you have Condoleezza Rice, who is a very influential figure in the Bush administration during the Iraq war that we study in this class. Uh, and all of them, I think, um, would probably face accusations that they succeeded and were able to achieve these positions of power because they shed their femininity and took on the roles and the qualities traditionally associated with men. Um, but they did so with a double standard, right? They did so um, simultaneously facing criticism for being um, too wedded to those, those traditionally masculine roles, right? So you look at the discourse around Hillary Clinton, um, how she was perceived, how she was publicly talked about, and <clears throat> she was taking on roles that were traditionally male roles, and she was adopting some of those, those characteristics, right? But she was doing so with this double standard where she would face criticism because she had adopted that role. So women in positions of power in international relations are in this double bind where um, you know, they have to project certain attitudes that have become expected in international relations, uh, which in some way, oftentimes it, it forces them to, fed, to, to shed traditional feminine roles, but then they face criticism precisely because they have shed those traditional um, uh, feminine roles, at least in their public persona or how they deal with certain situations. Um, simultaneously, if they were to adopt those traditionally feminine roles of nurturing and caring and things like that, they would face criticism as not being tough enough or not projecting power in the way that we traditionally associate with a leader, a foreign policymaker, somebody that's representing a country on a world stage in a very conflictual and troubled and challenging world. So it's a really difficult situation, um, and it's it's not one that we've managed to uh, kind of evolve out of. Although I think perceptions of women um, in, in many societies have changed over time, there's still a really challenging social field to navigate for women that want to be in certain roles with regard to international relations. And that's one of the things that uh, international relations analysts and researchers take up is looking at women in these sorts of positions and the ways that they have to contort and bend themselves to a series of really challenging expectations. So um, <clears throat> we'll shift now to applications. In the chapter from uh, Sterling Foker, you have two applications of feminist IR theory to the Iraq war, uh, one from Mertis and the other from D'Amico. Uh, one is a, a really an example of what we call a liberal feminist point of view, um, and the other is a more critical feminist point of view. So um, with Mertis, um, this kind of goes back to some of those assumptions and the implications of the worldview. Um, she's looking at the fact that one of the core justifications for the war was the construction of Iraqi women as victims, right? She says in the public discourse about the war, uh, women were framed in this, in this role as uh, victims in need of our protection. And that is problematic in the sense that if you look comparatively throughout the rest of the region, um, you see that women in Iraq were actually afforded opportunities and had a level of equality that many other countries in the region did not have. Um, so it is this way of kind of constructing a familiar um, victim in, in need of our, our rescue that is problematic and doesn't necessarily correspond to the experience of Iraqi women at that time. It also has the effect of denying Iraqi women agency, right? So. If you are a victim, then that means on some level you are helpless and you're need of, in need of rescue. Whereas she's looking at uh, Iraq in the lead up to the war and then as the war was unfolding and the aftermath of the war and seeing women that are taking a powerful role in shaping the future of their country. Um, and if you have a traditional kind of victim rescue narrative, um, that is much harder to, to wrap your head around. Um, so she is really asking the question, where are the women? Um, and when we analyze that question, uh, where are the women, it not only 
gives us a sense of how they're utilizing their agency, but it also reveals where they're not active. So there's a um, selection here on page 280. She says, um, identifying when women are active in the narratives underscores when they are not visible. Women are not seen at the nego negotiating table. Women are not included in the decisions that lead to war in the first place, nor are they involved in the decisions as to when and how to make peace. Would the mere inclusion of women change the decision on when and how to go to war? One need not essentialize all women as naturally peaceful and good and men as naturally warmongering and bad. A gender impact inquiry demonstrates that no one wins when women are excluded in this manner. Um, and that actually relates to this larger field of feminist IR research that suggests that societies that do have codified uh, gender equality and make an effort to include women in their uh, foreign policy making apparatus and their domestic political institutions actually um, weather natural disasters, conflicts, crises, these sorts of you know very challenging situations much better than societies that don't. Uh, so she goes on to say, strengthening equal participation of men and women in the political sphere is the right thing to do on the moral level because we value equality, but also equal participation is instrumentally desirable as participation strengthens democracy and thus advances all the liberal values associated with it. Moreover, because women's experiences with conflict are different than men's, because of their different socially constructed gender roles, women bring different skills, interests, and needs to conflict analysis and problem solving. So liberal feminism at its core, um, one of the core things that it is arguing is that we need more women in these positions and we need to not subject them to uh, you know, these masculine expectations of, of what uh, a leader on the international scene represents. And that actually makes us stronger and it makes us better able uh, as societies and as governments to um, ensure that we avoid conflict situations uh, whenever possible, that, but when we do find ourselves in a conflict, uh, we have, as she says, different skills, interests, and needs that come into play with conflict analysis and problem solving. So that's the liberal feminist perspective. It's slightly less radical. It's an argument for inclusion, for equality, for um, making a conscious effort to not only tell the stories of women and avoid mischaracterizing women, but to put them in positions of power where they can actually have an impact on international relations. You get a different take with um, Francine's, Francine D'Amico's piece um, the, from the point of view of critical feminism. Her piece is less focused on a single argument um, or a single perspective, and what she's basically doing is critical in nature. She's going through some of the aspects of the war in Iraq, and she's trying to kind of unpack, um, utilizing the insights of feminist theory to unpack what's actually happening. Um, and she's doing so critically, so she wants to undermine or um, you know, deconstruct the dominant narratives, narratives around the Iraq war. Um, so she does this in a number of different respects. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think there's a couple that are interesting. Uh, when she's talking about George W. Bush and his decision to go to war, uh, she frames it in relation of the masculine expectations of a son's duty to his father. Uh, she says, gender analysis suggests that on an individual level, President Bush may have been engaged in what is now colloquially called peacocking. That is a prominent and showy display of masculinity. Masculinity. Um, his willingness to use force may have been intended to single do signal dominance or demonstrate manly presidential credentials uh, in counterpoint to former President Bill Clinton's ineffective, effeminate, uh, non-proliferation efforts vis-a-vis -vis both Iraq and North Korea. So there is this, um, this attachment of tough, decisive, violent foreign policy decisions with masculinity. And we're seeing this right now with, with Donald Trump. Right, a lot of his hardening of language, his criticism of the Obama administration, he's trying to project himself as a stronger, more stern figure in international affairs, and he's portraying previous administrations, most notably the Obama administration, as weak or effeminate. Right? It plays right into that notion of uh, masculinity and, and femininity that uh, feminist theory uh, jumps into and, and really pulls apart. Um, she also talks about gender discourse used to justify the war itself. Um, so she says, uh, the purpose of the war is to liberate the oppressed from atrocity and to protect the world from Iraq's nuclear ambitions. Liberating and protecting are masculine gendered behaviors. Those in need of protection are feminized. 
that the WMD were as factitious as fire-breathing dragons is beside the point. The knight had to ride to the rescue because he is a knight, a man of action. So she's saying actually that this rescue narrative, that this you know protection narrative um, can operate wholly independent of the facts on the ground. The fact that there weren't weapons of mass destruction is irrelevant. Once you've created a role for yourself and it's the role of protector, um, then you'll sometimes engage in foreign policy decisions uh, in in con in in um, with uh, a lack of focus on or you know in in opposition to the facts that are in front of you. Um, and I should note here that uh, I think the author is probably pretty critical of the Bush administration and critical of the war in Iraq. So um, that is definitely influencing some of the assessments that she's making when she's using uh, feminist theory. Um, okay, jumping to uh, gender in the war itself. Um, she talks about how war is seen as men's work, women who want to serve in the military, an institution whose primary purpose is to prepare for and engage in war, are seen as violating society's prescribed gender boundaries. I think that's still the case, even though there's, uh, you know, lots of women uh, involved in uh, conflict operations. It is still um, largely a masculine activity and the expectations associated with uh, the military are largely domin dominated by masculine points of view, uh, particularly once we get to the level of warfare, once we get to the, the lever level of active conflict. Um, and so she's drawing attention to that. Um, the consequences of the war, um, she writes something really interesting here. I'll just read it and then talk about it a little bit. She says, women in a war zone are less likely to be combatants, but more likely to, to be displaced from their homes and communities, comprising a majority of refugees, which increases their vulnerability to both economic and physical victimization. In post-conflict societies, women's single heads of household have reduced personal security and access to resources, which results in a pattern of feminization of poverty. And there are gender, gendered political consequences as well. Soldiers who have sac sacrificed for their country are lauded as heroes and rewarded not only with military honors, but often also political power. Women who typically have not served in the military or who have fled from the fighting as refugees are not seen as potential leaders, but instead are encouraged to help heal the divided nation in caretaking roles. Um, and for a country like Iraq, which has experienced, uh, you know, in just the past 30 or 40 years, um, three devastating conflicts, you're dealing with generations of women who have been disempowered and displaced by war and who have lost uh, family members, husbands, sons, brothers to war. So um, in that case, it's, it's particularly striking. But, uh, you know, a thinker like D'Amico would apply this on the home front as well, that when men go off to war and they come home and they have PTSD, or they've suffered injuries as a result of their service, it's women who are asked to step up and ensure that you know, the children are still raised and the family can still keep their house and um, you know, all of those, those different uh, roles that, that women have to step up and play um, when they have a loved one returning from war uh, who may have suffered mental or, or physical injury as a result of that war. So feminist theory is, is going to look at how we talk about um, warfare and conflict, um, but do so with a particular emphasis on where are the women and what are the roles that they're playing. And they would argue that there is no setting in which women are absent. There is no setting in which women's experiences does not matter to understanding what's unfolding and to have a really granular and fine-tuned understanding of the experience of war. Um, so some different takes on the Iraq war from the point of view of feminist IR theory. Turning lastly to Dresner's book, uh, he talks about feminism in relation to zombie fiction. And um, he breaks it up into liberal feminists, critical feminists. He also talks about post-structural feminists, which um, there are sections on post-structuralism in your, um, your book by Sterling Foker. I don't go into it too much, mainly because it's, it's probably beyond the realm of... Um, it's, it's a little advanced and a little nuanced and complex for a 200 level class, but I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so the liberal feminists, uh, from the point of view of Dresner, he says that they would um, basically be making some of the same arguments as Mertes, right? So if we were to talk about a zombie outbreak from the feminist perspective, uh, 
Um, liberal feminists would look at that and say that states that have um, codified gender equality norms and have made a conscious effort to ensure that they have leadership diversity, so women are in positions of power, women are making decisions in the context of a crisis, would be better poised to deal with the zombie threat. Right? For the same reasons that Murta says, you have a diversity of experiences, um, you have uh, you know, a, a rich and diverse palette of leadership that is brought to bear on a complex issue and can think about it in a series of different ways. Um, so he says in his book, liberal feminists are aware of the myriad ways in which world politics marginalizes women. Um, they believe, however, that emancipation of women from traditionally gendered roles makes it possible for international society to function better. A significant body of research suggests that states that codify gender equality and restrict discrimination are more secure across a variety of dimensions. In other words, governments with more feminist-friendly policies are also more secure from external threats. It logically follows that the threat of the living dead should accelerate those emancipatory policies, thereby benefiting the marginalized even more. Now, critical feminists are going to look at this a little bit differently, and they would draw attention to the ways that inevitably, or almost inevitably, when you have crisis or disaster within a society, that tends to disempower and marginalize those that are already vulnerable. So, you know, poor people, um, ethnic and racial minorities, religious minorities are going to be disempowered in those settings. Um, you think to 9-11, for example, right? And so 9-11, you had this security crisis and the entire country was kind of freaked out. Um, but who suffered as a result? Well, you know, there were lots of government programs that had money siphoned off to fund uh, expansion of defense and anti-terror capabilities, so they suffered. Uh, but probably the group that suffered the most was Muslim minorities. Many of these people, you know, have been in the country for an extended period of time, consider themselves to be American, uh, find terrorism loathsome, do not support it. Many of them came to this country fleeing those forms of uh, religious violence and extremism, but they suffered as a result because they were stereotyped on the basis of their ethnicity or their religion. Uh, but feminists would particularly draw attention to the ways that crisis and, dis uh, and disaster disempower women, right? And so um, Dresner says, uh, critical feminism would take a more jaundiced view of the effects of the living dead on international society. They would also focus on how zombies would pose serious threats to the disempowered elements of existing society. Man-made disasters can even further marginalize the least powerful, powerful elements of society, particularly women. Consider, for example, the anticipated effects of flesh-eating ghouls on the organization of the state. Priority would inevitably be given to the security apparatus, and these are the areas of political authority that tend to be most exclusionary to women. So uh, there are you know, tons of women in positions of power in our government, but oftentimes when you have a security crisis, what happens is the decision-making circle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's largely the upper tier of the executive branch and then the defense and security apparatus of the executive branch. And those are settings in which it is much, much less common to have women in positions of power. So, you know, the, the military elite, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, we do have women in positions of power there, but it's a much smaller ratio than in other areas of our federal government. So not only would women potentially be disempowered, but then the decision-making apparatus would become more exclusionary to women. Uh, and Dresner would argue that that is uh, actually less likely to help us weather some sort of crisis like a zombie outbreak. Um, now, some of the elements of critical feminism involve deconstructing and kind of pulling apart critically some of these commonplace assumptions that we bring to international relations. And post-structural feminism, post-structural theory in, generally, in, in general, is about taking that deconstruction uh, to a level in which you entirely unravel things, right? Um, so you unpack security and within it you find that uh, how we define security actually contains within it in insecurity or lack of security. Um, they're all about taking dichotomies, seemingly black and white dichotomies like male and female or human and zombie, 
and breaking them down to the point where they lose their binary status, right? Pulling apart binary status and re revealing instead of black and white, what you have is an endless amount of gray. And so post-structural feminists, he argues, might even challenge the human zombie distinction altogether. That might be the way that they look at, uh, you know, a zombie outbreak. I'm not sure if that's the case, and I'm not sure how useful or valuable um, that distinction is. It's an interesting kind of thought experiment. Um, but if we were dealing with a zombie outbreak, then thinking about uh, breaking down the distinctions between who is a human and who is a zombie might not be the most effective strategy in a crisis situation. But that gives you a sense of kind of what post-structural feminism is about, is really deep um, uh, micro level kind of pulling apart of um, dichotomies and binaries and constructions and basically trying to unravel the ball of yarn that is any social construction uh, to reveal that it's much more complex and arguably that complexity helps us better understand the world and helps us avoid uh, assuming things to be true or assuming things to be uh, categorically our reality when in fact our reality is less clear and, and more complex. So um, anyway, I think kind of interesting and a lot of continuity between the applications that we're seeing with regard to the Iraq war and what uh, liberal feminists and critical feminists, uh, those perspectives would do with regard to zombie fiction. So for next time, um, one just reminder that I want you to be thinking about is that your pre-negotiation planning reports for the ICON's UN Security Council simulation are due Sunday. So um, be working on that, be thinking about that, and certainly be in touch with me if you're running into questions or the assignment is anyway, in any way unclear. Um, and then for next time, um, we're going to talk about Marxist theoretical perspectives, which is the last systemic attempt to understand international relations as a whole. And then there'll be a little bit of um, talking about how to apply IR theory. I've kind of uh, laden you with a bunch of uh, information about different theoretical perspectives and we've been applying it as we go to these two cases but I want to just talk about what are the types of questions you ask when you're trying to actually take these abstract conceptual frameworks and apply them to an unfolding event so for next time you're gonna read um, Sterling Foker chapter 7 and um, an excerpt from McNally which is available on Blackboard uh, Dresner actually doesn't have a section in which he goes into Marxist theories of IR and then it tries to apply them to, uh, to zombies. And his argument for why is kind of interesting. He claimed that uh, Marxists are so, um, pr so primed to view um, the, the underdog, the, you know, the dispossessed and uh, the disempowered as their hero that uh, they would potentially side with the zombies, which... I don't know if that is true, um, but this is an excerpt from a book that was uh, uh, written called Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism, in which the author is talking a little bit about um, zombies in relation to uh, capitalism and doing so from a Marxist perspective. So you're getting a little bit of um, that analysis of uh, a Marxist analysis of, of zombies. Um, so as you do, think about uh, how important are material economic factors in driving outcomes in international relations. The Marxist perspective is going to say they are paramount. Anything else that happens, whether it be political or social, rhetorical, um, all of those things are a superstructure and the real core of international relations and how decisions are made, how alliances are formed, how strategy is formed is um, the result of economic relations and uh, disparities in wealth and uh, economic power. So as you read this, think about whether or not the global system has a class divide similar to what we see within our domestic societies. In our own societies, we know that there are, you know, there are workers and there, there are, um, you know, owners, there are upper class people, there's the 1% and the 99%. We know that there's disparity in wealth and disparity in economic position and that shapes our politics and shapes our social relations. But do you think a similar thing exists on the global level and it does it have an impact on what international relations looks like? Or I guess to what extent is it um, an important factor in how international relations is carried out? So um, we'll wrap up there and um, we'll talk about Marxist theory and applying our theory next time. Thanks very much.